hier an. Ja. Ja. Um, welcome. Oh, hello. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, um, to this roundtable on Christoph von Dochmann's operatic career. But really, um, speaking to all of them beforehand, what they most want to talk about is not uh, the past. Uh, Peter Kattner's relationship, who's director of casting at the Royal Opera, Opera House, goes back uh, around about almost 50 years to 1967. Unfortunately, when yes. Yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when Maestro von Dochmann, you basically gave you a job in Frankfurt quite quickly, I think. Yes, that is, that is correct. Uh, you regret it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you regret Do it? You. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Nicholas Payne, yeah. um, who is the director of Opera Europa, uh, has a working relationship with uh, around 30-ish, you know, 20, 25, yeah. 30 years. We worked yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but the thing they most want to talk about is the future. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, d I do slightly want to think about the past just a little bit. Peter, yeah. please. No, but if you ask me about how it started, maybe on, this let's, little let's story is quite typical for, uh, for the maestro because I didn't know him. I was in Berlin. My father was, I was ve really very young then. My father was singer at the opera and uh, he was looking for an assistant uh, in Frankfurt where he became opera director and music director. And uh, somebody su uh, suggested me, uh, suggested to him he should meet me, and maybe that was the kind of uh, youngster he was looking for. So I met him backstage after a rehearsal of Der Junge Lord uh, by, by Henze, and we spoke for 15 minutes about this and that, and then he said, okay, let's try this. <laughs> and, and I got my first contract, and uh, I haven't been looking back since. I was with, uh, with Christopher for 15 years in Frankfurt and in Hamburg, and um, that was that, how my life would have gone if that hadn't happened, I have not the faintest idea. And he's still the best. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, have you, got a, you have, have you got a similarly sort of catalytic moment? I've been listening to performances conducted by Christoph Tagnani for, for not that long time, but for, for, for many years, and he was, for me, I guess, particularly an introduction to the works of Berg. Because when I first heard Berg, it was played in a very inaccurate way. Um, it, singers interpreted Schreckstimme as meaning you could really sing whenever you liked. <laughs> um, and orchestral players, it was pretty hit and miss as, as well. And I remember hearing both Wozzeck and, and Lulu, of course, which was in those days two-act Lulu, Mm -hmm. And I think probably for Christoph still to act Lulu. Absolutely. Um, and having sat through the three act one quite recently, I think he's probably right. Right. <laughs> um, but to hear these really difficult, complex scores as we then thought them, now of course they're the great masterpieces of 20th century, um, laid out so that you could hear the detail, that you could hear the words of the singers, but also the notes of the orchestral musicians, that was a kind of revelation. So when, many years later, I went to work with Peter at, at Covent Garden um, for the opera company, um, and I got to know him a little bit better because he, he did some, some shows for us there, which were pretty memorable events. Um, uh, Christoph, you're, the, in a way though, I, I, promise we'll get to the future, but I just want to go back slightly to, uh, well, to the time when you were the, the youngest general music director in, in, uh, in Germany in 1957 in Lübeck, and the, your, your stints at opera houses in Lübeck, in Kassel, in Frankfurt and Hamburg, and then latterly in Zurich, and as well as Vienna and everywhere else. I mean, this has been, effectively, that's where you learnt the craft of conducting was in the, was in the opera house, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, actually, you start to learn it once you're a coach, you know. Coaching was my first thing with Scholti in, in Frankfurt. And then I was lucky because somebody cancelled. It was actually Mr. Prohaska in those days who cancelled a ballet evening. And it was Daphnis and Chloe, the whole thing, of course, and the Holzgeschnitzte Prinz, the wooden prints. And uh, of course, they didn't find anybody. And uh, it was, he cancelled, I think, I got a call around 11.30, something like that, whether, whether I could do the evening. 
of these two pieces, and I did. And I actually did the deafness, not even looking at the score, and of course, wouldn't <coughs> rinse, I had to look. But what they did not know, that I had a little relationship with the prima ballerina, <laughs> and, and I played everything on the piano, you know, but they thought I'm a genius. <laughs> and so, so she danced for I, you at home. Yeah, so yeah. I got, I got terrific, a terrific review, and the wife of my later intendant in Lübeck, told she's, she did read all reviews in Germany. I mean, she was busy from morning to night reading <laughs> reviews. And she read this review in the FAZ, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine. And she told her husband, they were looking for a chief conductor, for a general music director, why don't you go down? He came down, he saw a performance, he invited me. And at the same time, Fritscher, he had, obviously he didn't read it, but Fritscher was the, the, the chief conductor in Munich. And he had heard about this, because of course it's a sensation, would be today a sensation if anybody could do it, but he, it it's, depends on the prima ballerina. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, in, a sense, in those days, um, then Fritzsche gave me an, also an offer as a first Kapellmeister in Munich, whether I would be interested. And I think one of my intelligent uh, decisions was not to do this, because as a first Kapellmeister, you have to be able to step into anything whether it's Götterdämmung or whether it's Fidelio or whether it's Traviata, you know. I didn't have the repertoire. So as a chief conductor in Lübeck, I could form my own repertoire, could put all the rehearsals on I needed, and they obviously needed to, and so that was good. And that's where I started, and I was just 27, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what state was, um, was, was Lübeck in as a house then? And what state indeed was that whole system? Because we probably all have the idea about the way that all of the great um, uh, German conductors of the Austro-German conductors of the 20th century have come through a system which we just don't have here mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of opera houses, in terms of the, the way that they work, yeah. in terms of the, the repertoire you have to learn, and how much opera matters in that in, in a city like Lübeck or Kassel or, or Frankfurt. You know, in these um, in these companies, like also even in Frankfurt, and also in, in for instance in um, Munich you do have about maybe four or six concerts, uh, uh, programs, in addition to your work as a music director of the opera. So you are educated as an opera conductor, which means you are really, know, after all, you know something about voices, you find people, you trust the personality, you know this will be okay and this will be not okay, you make mistakes and you can make mistakes mm -hmm. without being noticed and, and, and written about in all the big, uh, big journals. So in, in a sense, um, it, was a, it was a very good way to start this. In, and I would uh, recommend to anybody who would do nowadays, uh, who wants to have a career, if possible, start in a small opera house mm -hmm. and just learn conducting and learn accompanying having you know, it's not. Uh, it's something you cannot learn. Some do learn it in front of a, of a mirror. It doesn't work. You know, <laughs> you have to have the musicians there. You know? um, how is that? What, what, Peter Nicholas? What's your sense of where that system is now in Germany? Is it still as robust as it as it was in the 1950s and 1960s? Is it still something that that, that I think uh, everywhere else should envy? I think, by and large, I don't see huge changes. I mean, what we have seen over the years and what we partly engineered in Frankfurt and Hamburg was changing the repertoire system into a half stagione system. Not a, well, in some places now in Munich you have a complete stagione system. They do every opera only three times or f four times, but with unfortunately minimal, minimal rehearsal. So they do too much repertoire with too little rehearsal, mm -hmm. and that's not always so great. But uh, the small places still play by and large repertoire, so, that, so they do one butterfly in March and another butterfly in April, and uh, so those things have not dramatically changed in those houses, the structure. And uh, I ask myself if how much has changed over generally in, in, in opera over those one generation almost or two, two generations. Mm -hmm. And I always come for myself to the conclusion that for the, 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 the opera as such, for the product, the art form as such, not very much has changed because we are aiming for musical excellence and we are aiming for challenging 
productions, uh, whatever that means, and different people have different views what a challenging production um, is, but that has not changed at all. And when I came to Covent Garden many years ago, I don't think if we are looking at the, the pieces and the way how to, to plan them, to, 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 to cast them in any different way. What has developed over all those years is layers which are all important uh, but somehow secondary. So there is sort of the, the, the media uh, uh, question, the marketing, the access question, staff relations, audience relations, uh, money and management, management every, everywhere. And when there are sort of brainstorming sessions there over about those issues, they are not usually about the center what happens on stage. And that's sort of, that's some, sometimes buried under a pile of, 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 of other issues that all have their own role, but sometimes overshadow what we are actually doing mm -hmm. in the evening on the stage. Mm -hmm. Nicholas. What's your perspective on uh, I don't know, too much management, the way that that kind of culture has changed? Look, these two guys come from that German system. I observe it from the outside. Um, and it is something of wonder to, to me that there should still be, whatever it is, 84 opera companies in Germany, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. few more in Austria and Switzerland, together providing, I would guess, 50% of the world's opera. Um, it's a pretty productive system. And of course, some of it is better than other bits of it. Um, you could hear some pretty bad routine performances, and I guess you always could. And you could have some wonderful life-enhancing experiences. I think there is a real balance, you know. I think certain things have got much better in opera. And Peter refers to the sort of the access thing, the, the technology and so on, in a slightly, this is getting in the way of the opera, manner. Um, and I, I'm not saying I, 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 sim I sympathise with him, but in another way, it has helped create new audiences for opera, not, yes, not just in and Germany absolutely, and, and Europe absolutely. And, and beyond. And, and but it doesn't create better performances. The invention of the gramophone yeah. And, and, yeah. And, 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 you know, then the... CD, DVD, mm -hmm. and, and, and internet was, if used well, is 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 for us a bonus. We've got much better at singing Rossini or Baroque opera. Mm -hmm. um, early music groups actually occasionally play in tune. Now, mm -hmm. this is a big advance. Mm -hmm. um, and in other awesome. respects, we've probably got worse. Okay. Um, I, given the things that Peter says you now need to have in order to manage an opera company, all these other money aspects and so on, I wonder whether it would be possible to run an opera company the way Christoph did Frankfurt or, or, or Hamburg from the musical head. And if you look back on the great history of 20th century opera, you think of Mahler in Vienna, Toscanini in, 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 in Milan, Klemper in Kroll Oper Berlin, uh, Christoph in, 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 in Frankfurt and, and Hamburg. And what I learnt from that, and obviously don't replicate because that's not my skill at all, is the value of someone a top musician leading mm -hmm. an organization which is after all about making opera which is drama made through music and that's something very special and it's it I don't know that even the top conductors of today you know Levine or Petrenko or, 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 or um, w whatever can Papano even can, can, can quite manage that. Well, Christoph, let's, uh, is that what you thought you were doing in, in Frankfurt and Hamburg? I, did, I think <laughs> times have dramatically changed. I don't think you can compare it because in those days uh, I thought it would be the best idea to be on one hand the chief conductor really dominating the music and the musical procedures and on the other hand, managing it. I could not have done it 
in Frankfurt and in Hamburg without Mortier and without Peter, you know, because I could say, Peter, this one you should listen. And he, he brought, I mean, he discovered Varadi. I didn't discover her, you know. He was down there. He, Martin, for instance, you, uh, wasn't yeah. you? In, 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 Controversial then, then brought, yes, yes, and I, yes, and I got so some, uh, some other ones. Parents, but, but yeah. brought, so yeah. this so was sort so of... This is an amazing yeah. group But that was an amazing, I mean, we had all yeah. these singers in those, and yeah. but without them, you know, without Peter and without uh, Gérard Mortier, I, 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 it would have been most likely very difficult for me, mm -hmm. even if I have some, you might be a different opinion, but I had some managing talents, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Now's your chance, Peter. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but this was actually, nowadays I wouldn't do it. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Nowadays I wouldn't do it. But I regret very much that some opera, so-called opera conductors have not done their schooling, their, their education. It is very difficult for some of them, and that's why it's happening nowadays that the conductor is down there and says, I am the conductor and you have to <coughs> sing. We just talked about something. So, like but so you mean that the, actually the training there is partly a musical training around that relationship? You have to feel... But it's also, you may, but you it's also about the institution, actually, isn't it? It's yeah, also it's understanding also what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. It's I it. hear far too often these days an experience that conductors do not talk to singers, do not correct or criticize they singers, don't they, don't them. they don't even meet them. You know, why, well, I mean, there's a certain conductor who yeah, avoids them because there's always on the way to the next plane, but, yeah. uh, but even great. in a Can normal working, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a normal working uh, uh, context, one would expect that conductors are open with their artists and discuss with them, talk about their, their difficulties, try to improve them and not just to cover themselves and not, uh, not look for any, uh, any controversy. And Papano is emphatically not that. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. He is a singer's conductor who loves to work with, uh, with singers and does that all the time from morning till, uh, till night in between rehearsals. So that does not, ap not apply. But there are very many conductors who just come in, do their rehearsals, and and go home, and just avoid uh, really. And and it's not our job as administrators. I cannot go to uh, to a singer and start uh, working on their technique or say, well, you should rather do this or that. I mean, once. Well, I remember once Gwyneth Jones and Renny Collo came after a, a Götterdämmerung rehearsal to me and said, can you please tell Bernard Heiting to speed it up a little bit? And I said, I'm not an idiot. You've got to tell him. You are together in the rehearsal and that's your job as artists to talk to each other. Then mm -hmm. not call on the management, can you tell the conductor to be a little bit faster? That is <laughs> absurd. Uh, yeah. But if I wish that, that conductors if, and, and also, also directors, that they would engage more with the artists they are working uh, with and take responsibility, take risks and, and, and be sort of, uh, yes, on, on the ball rather than uh, sort of avoiding. Because uh, uh, again, yeah. it meant, I suppose this is another difference, not necessarily one just because of, oh. of, the, of the times in Frankfurt, but also because, uh, or oh, Hamburg, but, but rather because you're dealing with a company. You're dealing with a company of singers that, that in a way it's your duty to, to care for. Um, here now, the, the opera yeah, houses well, in this country, let's say, are set up in a slightly different way. But you care for the result, even if they're all guests. Know. You have to, it's yeah. a technical thing, it's very simple. If you don't coach singers, you don't know anything about yeah. singers. That's very simple. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to play the piano, and otherwise you have to make your experience while you are conducting opera. And the singers will be sometimes very unhappy, and then you are afraid to c contact the singers because you don't know much about singing, you see? And that's, that's a feedback which doesn't work, but uh, many, many, um, uh, I mean, I go to opera houses mm -hmm. from time to time, listen to performance, and two things are the major problems. One thing is changing the, the casting in the orchestra, which is partly disastrous, you see. You, you mean from performance to performance? In a sense, it's from performance mm -hmm. to performance. As I in mean, Vienna, for a, This is, for instance, the German system is yeah. you do until the pre-dress rehearsal, that's the last rehearsal before the dress rehearsal. They change and change and bring in people. Suddenly two people sit there and they're coming from, I remember this, I mean, I was in Hamburg conducting and two in, in winter, two freezing people <laughs> were sitting there, I hadn't met them before, and I said, where are you from? We are from Hanover, 
fine. I said, good. Are you going to play a performance? We don't know yet. So, <laughs> you know, so why not staying at home in winter time? You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I said, yeah, but that's the thing mm. which happens. I, w I listened in Hamburg because, um, I mean, I don't go in this city where I was the chief in the intendant and a chief conductor. I don't like to go these places. I also, at the end, they are for me. It's always difficult because people, how oh, do you like this conductor? So I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I sneaked in with my wife in the last part, uh, somewhere in the loge or somewhere, and and I did actually listen to a Tosca. And the conductor, I was interested because he, I knew him from contemporary music, and. Um, it was a disastrous performance. So, so, it, uh, so we sneaked out. Yeah. Okay, we went. Next morning, I called him and said, "Listen, I, I'm sorry, but I had to leave. You know, I was just too." Yeah, he said, "You know, it's you listen to the worst performance I've ever conducted because actually, I had for the whole Tosca two hours. It was a revival. Two hours. Tosca is longer than two hours. You know, but uh, anyway." Two hours he had rehearsal, and the performance he said, you listen to, I, you listen to, I had all woodwinds new, I've never seen the woodwinds, and the new concertmaster. Yeah. See, these things, this is also the German and Austrian and so yeah, but Nobody so talks German. about that. Yeah, but I part do, and yeah. everyone yeah. is bitching yeah. at me, but yeah. I'm right, you know, it's yeah. impossible. I remember once you did a Figaro revival in, in Hamburg, uh, and you did a few rehearsals with the orchestra, then admittedly you fell sick for the opening night, so you were not there, but on the second performance when you came, half the orchestra was different to the one that you had had in the rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And that was a continuous source of, of, of argument and aggravation, but nobody ever talks ab about yes. it. And Even uh, there's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, there's actually, they do this legally, there's nothing wrong. No. They have the right, for instance, the first, the first stands, you know, the first uh, chairs, mm -hmm. they have maybe only 50% the, the, of, the, of the services they have to do, and uh, they do everything is totally right, you know. And, you, and, and I think they should have free time as well as all the, I mean, why should, why should a musician uh, not take uh, part of our time's life, mm -hmm. you know? But the music doesn't really agree with it. And it also means, I mean, look, if, it, if, it's, if it's bad in Tosca in that way, for something like the, the Vassaris or De Junger Lord or any contemporary opera, it would be potentially still more disastrous where the music is yes, completely uh, unknown. The, the yeah, only the difference people would notice. So well. But it's not that that way they would have too many sessions. They don't have that many sessions, but in certain places they have the free choice what to do. And there I have to blow our trumpet here in, in London. Absolutely. Uh, and I've always made sure that it doesn't get forgotten that this system of a not changing orchestra cast for every single uh, single opera production does not get forgotten or watered down. It just means that the musicians do have the free choice. If they want to play Tosca, they have to play all rehearsals and performances. And if they don't want to, then they don't have to. They can freely choose in which opera or for which conductor mm -hmm. they play. But if they choose one, then they have to be with that production from the beginning I'm, to the I'm, end. I'm, I'm and that is one of the major advantages I'm, of this I'm, I'm place. And the same is true, you know, in, well, in your time and, and still, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I mean, unless someone's ill or, or, or something yeah, like that. Of but, course, of course. but it was something, um, certainly when we were at Covent Garden together, we made an absolute. Yeah. And then there's the intendant. had to fight about. And as a result, we got a very good list of conductors. Mm. Your second and then conductor. there's the intendant, you know, as in, uh, this also because being chief conductor and intendant, as an intendant you would have to interfere. As a chief conductor you somehow depend on the orchestra also, this is a mutual dependence, mm. you know, so in the interdependent. So in a sense it, it, that makes it hard, that's why I wouldn't do it nowadays anymore, it's almost impossible. And, uh, but uh, things like that happened, happened uh, and still are happening and it's, it's, uh, uh, it is avoidable.
It yeah. is avoidable to a certain degree, at least avoidable. You know? I wonder if your your second big thing that you observe is something to do with singers. And to that end, I want to: How did you all work, all of you, in, in your experience with singers in different ways? I mean, you of course directly working with them, casting them, thinking about how they fit into a company. That that sense of what your responsibilities are to actually shape the voice of Hildegard Behrens or Eva Marton or, or whoever it is. <laughs> How did you do that? Yeah, you, you would uh, try to protect voices for, um, for singing wrong parts, you know. Um, a tenor who, is, who sings Giacchino or sings, uh, one certainly wants to do mimes. It's my fach, you know, it's, it's wrong, you know, it can be very wrong. But it's, nowadays they do Giacchino and then they sing Siegfried. And that's even more, even more wrong, you know. And so one has to be careful to, to protect them. So because otherwise, I mean, I had an experience, and um, usually he knows that uh, Kayan was very clever of sending his spies to our houses, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. So we had... But to try and steal your singers, basically. Yeah, and, and yeah. When, even when I was a few years in Kassel after Lübeck, small city, and um, we had a singer who actually was ver a very talented, very talented singer. And, 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 and he could go up to Max Freischitz or things like that, you know. And Kayan had sent somebody and he called me and, you know, um, how about this, or what, what's my opinion, and so on and so on. And we, we, I, I respected him very highly, I think. Still, he was one of the greatest conductors in, in this world, you know, an unbelievable conductor. But anyway, he called and, and he said, you know, I plan to do Parsifal. I said, you are going to ruin this voice. I said, that's wrong. He did, and he ruined the voice. Mm -hmm. He never sang again. I've seen that you with know? many major conductors who are wonderful artists, but are very selfish when choosing singers, and they use them for one or two things. If it goes wrong, tough luck, they get thrown away. And, and Karajan, and not just Karajan, if, if did many such things, not deliberately, of mm. course, but uh, then, then you say to somebody, oh, you are the Isolde that I've been waiting for all my life, and then when it goes wrong, uh, they turn yeah, elsewhere. But it's also recording, yeah. you know. The recording, yeah. I remember some a very famous Italian singer, sang Aida in Salzburg. Of course, for recording you can do these things, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But she shouldn't have done it in Salzburg, you mm -hmm. see? And that's sometimes, uh, you know, you have this huge audience. And, and of course, uh, some people, or some conductors, are very much con uh, concerned about recordings, and then they record it, and they don't really care about the singer, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in a, in a sense, it, I mean, it's a very sensitive thing. Um, this opera casting, the whole business is so wonderful, opera, because it's so absolutely unpredictable, unpredictable you know. It's a, it's a wonderful. I mean, I miss it very much. I would love to do more, but under these conditions, wherever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, most of the conductors escape. <laughs> Kurtfengler, <laughs> Toscanini, all these people escape. Klemperer. Nicholas, how, how did you help your, uh, your conductors? Let me answer the situation. question partly sure. in relation to these no, two people. But you've also escaped. Um, yeah. <laughs> it helps very much if you have a head of casting like Peter. There are other good ones, but Peter is kind of king, um, who really understands the limits of a voice. We used to have discussions sometimes in which he would say, well, maybe she could do this or, 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 or something, or I would suggest someone, he'd say, oh, not that yet, and, and he was very careful in, and a very good judge, of course, not an infallible judge, but a very good judge of, of what this or that the singer can do, and this is an enormously beneficial thing. It also helps enormously to have a conductor who understands working with singers, not just the coaching part of it, which is something that Papano is also fantastic mm -hmm. at, and, and others uh, you know, uh, as well, but also in balancing. The greatest lesson I learned when he conducted Salome for us at Coffin Garden, and I sat in many more rehearsals than I should have done because it was just so fascinating, and I should have been doing the budget or whatever, <laughs> um, was that he made the orchestral players and the singers listen to each other. And this was a fantastic lesson. And he drove them crazy because they weren't quite in tune. 
And he would go on and on over the same piece until they got the intonation right. Likewise, with the, the balance between the, the singers, you know, Zalame is a, how big is the orchestra? 90 people, whatever. Um, I mean, it's ridiculously overscored by Strauss. Um, but he made it transparent so you could hear the words that, that, that they were saying, which was why that Zalame was the best Zalame that's mm -hmm. been done mm -hmm. in, 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 in London in my lifetime. It, 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 it always strikes me as quite uh, intriguing sometimes when, uh, when, you, when you go to the opera or even hear concert performances and you have, I'm thinking of Wagner particularly, you have these wonderful singers standing at the front that says, you can't bloody hear no. them. You think, your first responsibility, I mean, I don't know much about conducting, but surely the job is, they've got to be heard. They've given their whole lives, they're <coughs> blasting their guts out for three hours by the end of Act Three of Tristan, and you're letting the orchestra do all this stuff. It's ridiculous. I mean, I thought that's absolutely, you know, conducting 101 is shut them up oh. so they can hear, you know, or you've got to find, I mean, you know, clearly it's more than that. But, I mean, but, the but I'm, I'm, but I'm wanted amazed. the words well, they set to I'm, be heard. Well, then precisely, but then, the, the, but you've got this problem now with conductors who haven't got that experience of working in opera houses, often in late romantic repertoire, and are not in control of that balance at all, it seems to me. I'm talking purely from a punter's point of view. I, I think, we look, we all agree that. Let me add, though, the third element, and this is the yes, element sir. in which I am annoying to people like Peter mm -hmm. and, and, and Christopher. Off. And that is, I, as, as an opera manager, had also to work on behalf of the stage director. And I had to get that director a cast which he could make a drama with. Now, sometimes that meant saying, when Peter came up with a perfect singer, no, I'm sorry, that singer will not be able to to work with really? it, it, Did it, that happen? It, it simply <laughs> was. I, I used to drive you mad by saying we have to have yet another audition for the, these I people see. because our lovely director is not happy that this one will sing with that one and, you know, and, 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 and whatever. It is another element of mm -hmm. opera and mm -hmm. in the end it's, it's a team game. No, it's actually, <clears throat> that's, I mean, what we did together in Frankfurt mm -hmm. was actually the beginning uh, we have to say that, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. the beginning of theatre in opera, absolutely. There was nobody before Mortier, C Peter and I, who did really absolutely consequently try to find. We had, you, you name them, but we had lots of stage directors from film and wheresoever, mm -hmm. because I knew the most important thing, and I, I staged myself, and maybe not even too bad. You but know, it is worth remembering. Yes. How many you know, productions yes, did you I, make? I you? mean, with Freya the Fidelio, with Freya the F Figaro uh -huh. in Castle, I did Don Giovanni and things like that. Yeah, so well. actually, for me, it's extremely important what's up, what's happening there, because I'm bored to death if these people up there only sing. You know, and that's why I don't like some of the operas Peter loves. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> there has to, I mean, what can you do in some of these old operas, you know, where you, you, you put on a whole opera evening for one singer, because Mrs. Mrs. So-and-so wants one aria, you know, and that's why then you get her, you know, and then she gets, can, can record this stupid piece. That's actually, <laughs> uh, the, the garbage in mm. opera is, the, the, the can, can be, cannot be big enough, you know, mm. get rid of this stuff, main, and have new pieces. But on the other hand, theater is very important, but the combination, that's what's the art about it. And that's why I think if somebody who has a sense for theater and a, is a good musician, or vice versa, you know, for instance, Günther Rennert was a great stage director. He had, a, his brother was a conductor, yeah. you know, opera conductor, pretty good one. And so, you know, he would say something, if I did Lulu with him in Munich, and he would say, listen, uh, can, can, can we do this? She was a little, uh, does it, I said, you know, it's, we, it's, she can go to the Isla, which is a, it's the river over there. We, we'll be together. It's not a question of being together, it's a question of how it sounds, whether the composer is represented right. Yeah. You know? So this, that's why a musician as a director or a stage director as a, as a director who is, has a certain sense for music. But the, it's too many times you find an extreme stage director who really is very gifted not being balanced, not being somehow influenced by the music, you see? And so that's nowadays, you have so many times these disasters. 
which we should feel guilty. Because but, but, but we I mean, but it's quite clear you need to do both things. It's not, is the voice more important than how the person acts? You need both yeah. things together. And that is what yeah. casting. Casting is not just finding good singers, but casting is to get the right combination of people and uh, get people who are uh, ready both to perform and to sing, uh, to play and to sing the role. What does annoy me sometimes that one gets a feeling that people, also audiences, listen more with their eyes than their ears, actually. That's also an in imbalance. But basically, it's, it's very banal and, and, and simplistic. You have to get both things right. And uh, that's what, we've, what we tried. And what, what, when I look back over those years, I don't know if one sort of the vision gets a bit blurred or the, the memory gets a bit blurred, but I feel many of those productions in the 70s that we did in, in Frankfurt and that also emerged elsewhere, they, I think they have stood the test of time rather well. When I look pic at those pictures of that Figaro and that Fidelio in Frankfurt or Achim Freyer's Magic Flute, they would be modern and valid today, I feel. Mm -hmm. And at the same time today, I'm not talking about us here in London, but in general terms, we see so many disappointing productions. Not because they are too traditional or too avant-garde, just disappointing just productions. Up, yeah. Is that because we are getting older or because really the, <laughs> if, if the level of achievement, I mean, there's so many productions that sees once and said, oh, well, just about, it's maybe half all right, but I hope I don't have to see that, that one again. But Peter, there have always been terrible productions. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but in, in, you know, it has been different because uh -huh. uh, in the earlier days, you know, in the 19th century, and also in the beginning of the 20th century, and including Klemper's uh, staging of Fidelio with uh, dogs and, and, and children on the stage and so on, yeah. you know, uh, and the whole text had to be spoken, and actually there were terrible productions, but sometimes great musicians yeah. and great voices, you know, and I, I, I mean, that's the other side of the coin. Of course, you know, it is the problem whether opera, uh, and that also is somehow applying to symphonic music. We should analyze this. Where is the root of this partly, partly disaster? There are very few great new pieces. You know, there are very few great new pieces, pieces where the public also is involved. There are some, but too little. Ooh. And in those days, in the days of obviously where, I mean, I always say, you know, Beethoven wouldn't have sat down and played a Mozart evening, you know, a Mozart recital. He played his music mainly, you see. And um, from Mendelssohn on, we started playing other people's music. And the so-called interpretation started when it couldn't be authentic anymore mm. because actually the composer was not identic with, or the, uh, the librettist was not identic with the, mm. the uh, uh, performer. You, you could have changed that. I mean, and you wrote a ballet that was done in, uh, was, uh, it, was, was that was a, Yeah, that was only I wanted to conduct and you know, they didn't see me conduct yet. And I said to Scholte, I'm also a composer, you know, but I, I, it wasn't so bad, but it's, I didn't consider myself and would never consider myself as a composer. Mm -hmm. But I know a little bit about composing. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, we have some new pieces. We have great composers also in this country. Here, great composers. I did, you played Bird Whistle. I conducted mm -hmm. a lot of Bird Whistle. And so on. He's a great man, great composer. Um, we do have a problem to to make this understood by the public. The public is not behind, but you know, they have they are being confronted with something. Uh, they they think they need be to be prepared by some speeches, by some introductions, and things like that. No. Open your ears and listen. You see, they go in the woods and they come back in the morning and say, "It's what a wonderful the birds did sing, and it was so beautiful. A little bit of a of a wind was going, and it was beautiful. And the nice little creek was 
making a nice noise to him. And then you do the same in the opera or somewhere, and they say it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, I mean, I mean, that's, but we that's, have that's something you've Messian, tried Messian, to do. Uh, yeah. Les, oiseaux, les yeah. oiseaux is composed, you know, and it's uh, suddenly, uh, there's something has happened. But, 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 but there, are, there are a couple of things there which uh, you're all collectively responsible for. Uh, one is, in a way, the replacement of the, of the, of the the demand for something new has gone backwards in time as well as forwards in time, hasn't it? And perhaps, arguably, it's gone too far back. I.e., the the you know you've, we've had to inter a whole. Uh, I mean, rightly, it's wonderful music, but I mean not just a baroque, but French baroque, uh, Handel, uh, um, uh, other um, Italian baroque. I mean, there's a, there's a vast slew of that repertoire which is now part of uh, the repertoire which isn't before, and which arguably one could say takes the place of. Uh, or seems to satisfy a curiosity for something new that there's, there's actually going to be relatively familiar rather, rather yeah, but than it's a different to. Uh, to, to. Only a point of view, but I mean, you, you, you've all in your different ways tried to change that. I mean, Nicholas, when you were, you, know, you, were, you were commissioning a lot of new work, I mean, a lot of new things. And at Covent Garden. Yeah. Um, I mean, when, when I was at Covent Garden, this, um, this was before it reopened, I felt very strongly that we needed to have new pieces in the, in the re reopened theatre. And we commissioned pieces from Bert Whistle, from Tom Addis, from Nicholas Moore. And the idea was mm -hmm. that there would be one in each of the opening seasons. Of course, they didn't write them as quickly as they said they would. Um, and so they, they came in roughly one every two seasons or something like that. But at least they were major mm -hmm. new pieces. Some perhaps are regarded as more successful than others, but they've been revived. Um, uh, all of them. Look, I think we, we, we can't turn back history. Um, when I f grew up with, with opera, the repertory was contained within 200 years. It began with Gluck's Orfeo, um, and it went up to the latest work of Britain or Henser, or, or whatever. <coughs> now it's 400 years. Mm -hmm. Monteverdi's Orfeo to Bert Whistle's The Cure. Um, um, you know, there was simply much that. So it, it's a difficulty squeezing in those things, but I think. I think that unless you are creating new works, in, not just in offbeat little places, but in the leading opera houses, then, then opera dies. But we, we, we have been doing our, uh, our yeah. bit beyond uh, uh, Burst Whistle and Tom Adish. Yeah, uh, yeah. The next piece will come next uh, year. George Benjamin, written on skin, was a huge mm -hmm. success. You couldn't get a ticket for it. The next opera is coming in 2018. Uh, Turnage is writing another uh, piece, uh, more, there is, there is more, more than one a year. Yeah. And I think the one event that I won't forget, I don't know if it was during your time, when we uh, when we premiered Boulevard Solitude by Henze mm -hmm. in a actually very brilliant, yeah. uh, uh, attractive production, yeah. except that it didn't sell any tickets at all. I mean, we are just before the first night, I think we were sitting there and there were 200, 200 seats sold or so. Total disaster. And there were all sort of marketing ideas coming. How can we fill the house? How can we do something to make it look better? Not sure to what degree. But that was a wake up call really to look. And there I have to sing the praise of, of marketing, how it has developed and fine tuned over the years. Then we started really changing our price structures and finding audiences for certain pieces. And, and directing uh, our efforts at the people who would be interested to see that. And then we, we introduced really uh, um, uh, uh, price schedules that were much lower, but reached an audience that was really keen on seeing the minor tour by Bert Whistle and, 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 and the next piece. And suddenly we were selling those pieces out. But if you try to charge 200 pounds uh, that you can sell Traviata for, then uh, not the right people come or cannot afford to come. That has changed dramatically. Last time we did Wozzeck, which was always very difficult to sell. Last time there was, it was really hugely subsidized at much lower mm -hmm. prices, and we totally it's sold old. out. Mm -hmm. And Simon Roby, the chairman himself, I think, uh, bought the whole grand tier and gave the tickets away to, st to students. And uh, it, it was really, this much has happened uh, over the last mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 years in that area. And we are now have no problem selling new, new pieces, pieces that people haven't seen. It is still difficult for some modern classics like Lulu or so. It was very difficult uh, to sell last time. But the really new pieces, Nicholas Moore's Sophie's Choice, you couldn't get a ticket mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, that has changed, mm -hmm. and there's a quite a different atmosphere. So do, you, do, do you think that's 
that that that, you, that, that sense of a new <laughs> repertoire is in a, a better situation than say than, than after after you premiered the Bastards of Henso or whatever it, are things better now? Do you think? <clears throat> I think uh, first of all, I mean, uh, Covent Garden has certainly um, done a lot uh, to help there, and uh, I think it's the right direction. Um, they should, uh, are they not, but we all should um, think what we can throw away. Yeah, what we can throw away, I mean, the garbage is, uh, 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 there is very, very interesting books I read rather short time ago. I started to deal with the um, aesthetics and um, partly also the disaster of the 18th century in the sense of quantity to quality. And I came to a very interesting thing. Moses Mendelssohn died six years before Mozart died. Mm -hmm. And Moses Mendelssohn had an equation, you say, equation, a Gleichung, equation, mm -hmm. you know, M times P to T, that's art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that means <laughs> quantity to quality to time. Yeah. And people, this, this is a very small book by Terrifican, and later there's also Adorno and, and Horkheim and all these people de dealt with the aesthetics of the, of the um, uh, 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 century, of the 18th century, of the Aufklärung, as we, uh, we say. In the Enlightenment. Yeah, yeah, right, in Enlightenment time. And quantity was a terrific, very, very important um, point in this whole thing, you know. So lots of Mozart has been written under these, mm. under these circumstances, you know, where somebody said, a very famous philosopher said, you know, if you, you know, and it was not a philosopher, it was Mr. Uh, some guy, his name was Maya, I think, and actually he, he told, uh, asking why he wrote 2,000 songs, leader, 2,000. He said some of them are certainly good. It's like if you have a, uh, if a tree, a plum tree, you shake it, the green ones fall down and the good ones fall down. But the green ones we should really get rid of. And all composers of these times, I mean, they're, as we all know, we don't have to say, I mean, they're the real, great, immortal Mozart pieces. And there are also pieces which are not worthwhile to do now. So why doing these pieces and not doing some contemporary pieces instead? Mm. You see? And there, I think, actually, Moses did this, and Mozart died short later. Mm -hmm. Quantity was a kind of proving I am a great artist in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And we still do it and play these pieces mm -hmm. because some, some aria might be good. But there are lots of green plums falling yeah. down, you know? <laughs> it's your job to pick them, Peter, I suppose. The green plums. Yeah. yeah. Talk about <laughs> the green plums you are performing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just uh, thinking again about uh, conducting, and I, d I just want just uh, more on this sense of what it means to coach singers. As I alluded to this earlier, but you're w when you're working in that company situation, and when you have people coming back and back, not just the, uh, one or two stars a season, but people who are really there in your house the whole time. I mean, it must that must g g give a different set of possibilities about what opera can, what you can do as a company. I mean, th that was the what you experienced. I mean, that's what how English National Opera well, and of course Covent Garden used to be set up. No? But it's no longer, and that's I'm afraid coming to terms with 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 reality. I love to go <coughs> to a remote part of Europe and find there is still a company there. But inevitably, you will find that the really good young ones are stolen by, very soon, by, because of, of, of <coughs> the labour market being what it is today. So you can't it's, go to Ostrava or, or, or Lviv or, or whatever it is and find the singers hidden away as, as you might, might have done. So what you do instead, and what Covent Garden does, and English National Opera does, and, and a lot of other, other fine opera companies is to try to develop relationships with, with singers mm -hmm. which, which reflect the fact that they're living in a global situation and that a really good young mezzo-soprano who you want to nurture and which Peter says, okay, we give you this role this year, that role next year, 
you work with our music staff and maybe you can do this one in whatever, can also go off and sing in Aix-en-Provence or, or Frankfurt or, or whatever and become a... And, and I remember talking with, with Peter about some singers who were in the company in the, in the days when we had a company still, and he said to a particular baritone, now is time for you to go and do a fest contract in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I say and, that and still And it was very, it was very good, for, very good for that singer, you know? If they are good enough for, uh, to star at Covent Garden, they are good enough to sing elsewhere in the world and yeah. you will not be able to, uh, to keep them in one place. Yeah. And at the same time, when you, we, we play about 19, 20 operas, so there may be two or three roles for a lyric tenor, for example. So if you have somebody in the company who sits there the whole year, you would have to give him those two or three roles at least. Mm -hmm. But it would have to be so good to be cast in those at the expense of everybody else in the world, they say if that person is that good, you won't be able to keep them. So mm -hmm. somehow okay. I've never got out of that. But uh, you still want to make the relationship with that yeah, singer yeah, yeah, you really yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. that they come back mm. and they feel that mm. in a way you have an interest in, in, in the trajectory of that. But that, that, that must involve sometimes quite difficult conversations. I mean, were the times that you had to in, in your dealings with the, the singers who became, who became stars thanks to your discovery of them and the opportunities you gave them. Did, did you have to, was that sometimes a difficult process, coaching them, actually helping them or? You know, it started in our days already and now I hear this so many times from smaller houses, whether it is, for instance, in the United States, smaller orchestras, I went to one of the, I always like to go to one of my assistants, early assistants, they are now music director, mm -hmm. and Michael Stern, the son of Isaac Stern, for instance, his assistant is the chief conductor in Kansas. And I went there, and I conducted a concert with him, and it was very nice, and I thought, and I said to my wife, this clarinet is heaven, and this bassoon is marvelous. The clarinet is now at the Metropolitan and the bassoon in Chicago Symphony. Yeah. See? Yeah. And that's the dis uh, that was my depression partly in, in Frankfurt. We found wonderful singers. And after a year or two they said, listen, I would love to stay, but I get the money you can pay me in one month being here, I get in one evening somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You see, this was Kottobos, this was Spalzer, this was Barton, this was Vardy, all these people mm -hmm. started with us. And that's kind of depressing. It must be very depressing for you. Now, of course, it's different, you know. People like to sing at Covent Garden, and so you might get them, but, uh, might get them, but maybe there's an opera who does pay more than you do, I don't know. Do you pay the other? Yes, there, no, there are places, but there are usually smaller places who pay more right. to get that's, the top-class right. people. Yes. So we have a certain advantage that because we're Covent Garden, we don't, we don't quite to have to reach yeah. Yeah. the very yeah. top yeah. level because the, the, the attraction like, to sing here comes It's like it's Manchester United as opposed on. to Manchester yeah. City, and they have yeah. to pay more. It's yeah. 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 no, yeah. yeah. also a matter, yeah. of course, a tenor, which really wants to keep his high standard level, mm might be able to sing once a week, yeah? But we had tenors in, 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 in Frankfurt, mm. very good ones. They sang every day, mm. you know? Wow. Yeah, mm. but Mr. Winkler. Yeah, every okay. Day. <laughs> every day, yeah. every day. Yeah. And made 5,000, five times or six times a week. Mm -hmm. 5,000 is 30,000. But some oh. singers are, are really stupid. They, they, they push towards heavier and heavier repertoire and think because that will make them more. Yeah, but Winkler could sing three or four times Mozart per week. If he had turned into a Wagner tenor, he could have only sung once a week. Mm -hmm. Right. That's Would he I have said. earned that's in that one I performance said. that much as he got for three or four performances? <laughs> may the fee may have been somewhat lower, no, but it added up to I'm more. Sure. And so. I just yeah. want um, uh, before I think we uh, uh, is that, uh, is that, have we got time for a few questions from the floor? But I just want to check. What, what time do you want to chat about it here? <laughs> well, I think we've got a few more minutes. I just want to th just just before I hand things over to you for a few minutes. Um, the, um, there's the, the there's something it's, it's in this wonderful biography. Your very good biography, often signed to her, of which there are going to be a few. You brought a few copies, have you? Some of you can yeah, buy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but sure it's, it's in yeah. German, though. But, yeah, no, it's, well, it's fine, no problem, yeah. But the, um, 
that there's something you touched on it, but thinking about uh, access and outreach. There's just one thing. Um, actually, Peter uh, Puskas was telling me about uh, the, this brilliant thing you did with the with the restaurant in Frankfurt, and it seems visionary on on very many levels now. But it just it just might be worth telling people about because yeah, this I is mean, a very uh, bold. In Frankfurt, we project. didn't have we didn't have much money. We I tried two things. One succeeded, and one did not. Uh, from the, these kind of uh, ideas, which don't have essentially to do with music, you know. So one was put monitors at the outside of the house, and we even succeeded by doing having monitors, for instance, in the center, in the in the U-Bahn, in the in the subway. You know, you could see what's happening in the opera. So house. not just the shows, but yeah, rehearsals. No, everything is like you went just a feed. to the, you went to the to the room where the where the things where the, the sets were were built oh. and we went to the orchestra rehearsal stage rehearsal and so on. Um, both of them was uh, we did it for a few days or weeks I don't remember how long it was and actually then the publisher of the piece of Rosenkavalier or whatever would come you have to pay it was longer than three minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we had to quit, really, we, we, this whole thing. Now you see the, the monitors, nice there you see the program on mm -hmm. it, you know, mm -hmm. boring. The other thing was better, and it has to do with food, you know, it has to do with eating, it has to do with enjoying life. Anyway, so uh, we were out there and uh, I said, there's a restaurant, usually, it used to be a restaurant in the building of the theater, which was totally, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, Leah? Uh, empty. Uh, empty. Uh, empty, yeah. totally empty. Totally empty, never anybody, it was actually closed, you see, it was closed. So we were out there in, in a house, I was living a little bit outside of Frankfurt, and we talked and we were talking about it, and I said, listen, why can't we use it and just put young people, get young people there and do something with it? And uh, yeah, we don't, the technical director said, we don't have the furniture. And I said, why not going to our fundus? How is fundus in English? The prop store? No, is it? Yeah. Uh, the, the, where all the sets are, the old yeah. sets are. Okay. And do, uh, do actually do something like a poem, a room. Theatrical and, uh, furniture. Theatrical, yeah. theatrical things, you know, yeah. and so on. And uh, of course, very awkward because these chairs on, on, in, in this uh, uh, performance uh, they are not very great, you know, uh, not very, very bequem. Anyway, we did that, yes, we did that, and opened it, and it was jammed with young people, you know. And still today, that's the only, uh, only thing I really left in Frankfurt. Today still, it says Fundus. fundus. Huh? Yeah. 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 You could be the savior of English now. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, th that's the that's the fun part about mm. uh, being in opera in opera business. It's, it's a it's, it's a great thing, you know. Generally, without food, no opera house would survive <laughs> these days because it has become a source of income <laughs> everywhere yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah, dine yeah. and wine yes, and yes. and uh, <coughs> dance teas and, and everything. I mean, that every opportunity is used to sell food uh, mm. at probably inflated prices. Uh, at the <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't say that. Which no, no. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, the floor, yeah. floor is yours for a, a few minutes, if you want. You may feel that you want to go to Hello, yes. Um, from when we started a working in opera, this title of exclusivity, do you think that has shifted? I mean, I get the impression now with sort of lower prices and more access, um, but, you know, I'm, I get intensely annoyed when people make this accusation that it's very <laughs> in like London, the prices of going to a football match. Um, do you think that's changed at all? I think it has changed a lot. When you look at the audience, it is really much more diverse in all, in all directions. It is still, for the core repertoire, in my view, far too expensive for the better seats. But there is a huge number of seats available at much more affordable prices. But the reason why we have to charge those, those prices is because unless we make that income that covers about 35 or 40 percent of the overall expenditure, uh, the house could not be run. That is 
in, in, in this country, the, the public subsidies obviously are shrinking more and more, and we are heading down to something like 20% probably before, before long. That's still completely different in, in, in Germany. There are also financial problems everywhere, but generally the arts funding, as everybody knows, in, in, in Germany is, is multiples of, uh, of most other countries. And the opera houses are funded to the tune of 75% or something like that. So the prices are much more affordable. Uh, and uh, that's the, the, uh, the problem is we are sort of victims of our own success when, we, of course, we can sell La Traviata for a top price of 200 pounds, then the government or the Arts Council will say, well, if you can, if you can get that money, why throw it away? Yeah. So if we were struggling more to sell our seats, there was maybe more of an argument to expand public uh, uh, money, though that's maybe naive. That but also you, enables yeah. you to sell Wozzeck or, or, yeah. or uh, yeah. 50 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. But at whichever way you package it, at the end, we need to make that a certain amount of money to be able to operate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, it's in the airlines, it's the same. The first class really finances the airlines, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the mm -hmm. business class. And, and that's, I mean, <coughs> unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the way in theaters too, you know. But the, the, um, the, the, the small anecdote on that. In, in Vienna, I discovered, I assumed in Vienna there would be, like, like Berlin, that, that it would be very heavily state subsidized. After all, you know, a huge percentage more than any other city of you know, tourism coming to Vienna is coming to, for, for music in some way. The, the Opera House there gets 14% state funding. Very small, um, m m less than uh, about half as much as the, as the Opera House here, which is, which is rather extraordinary when in Berlin, for example, the, as you say, the Opera Houses are 80, 85% funded. I mean, I think part of the answer to that, I think, is just the feeling that if, if there was an Opera House in every city in the United Kingdom, that, that, that would also, you, you'd never have that argument, that, that word exclusivist or elite, it just could never be used because it's just there, it's just something you use. It's like, you know, it's just a, an amenity. <laughs> which, is, which is largely how, how, you know, how it feels in Germany. And that's, and that's something, when you've got so few, there's always going to be, I, I don't know. Wiener Staatsoper is 50% subsidy. 50. I was told, I was told on, at the no, weekend that it was 14. They, they were lying. It sounds fine. fine. Not fine. <laughs> fine. Yeah. No, but that, I was told that that was the, that was yeah. the guy who I mean, was the it, it's still, It's still, in, in German terms, quite, quite a, 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 a low proportion. Mm. And of course, the top price seats are quite expensive. Like yeah. you, you're right. I may have been confused. Yes, you're quite right. I was thinking uh. about the Musikverein and the concert house. The yeah. Musikverein, only, only, I promise you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Musikverein is sorry. a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. stimmt. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. And the Neujahr's concert, the New Year's concert, yeah. doesn't have to be funded at all. No, well, on the black market, <laughs> there is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, which? Thank you. Uh, Maestro, I think uh, there are many people, most of us, would agree with your assertion that for a young conductor to learn their trade by going away to an opera house, to uh, away from the limelight, uh, that's where um, you cut your teeth, where as you mentioned earlier, Karian had his nine years in Ulm. Um, but outside Germany, as indeed you, Nicholas, pointed out, that there are 84 opera houses there. Now, it's so difficult nowadays, is it not? Absolutely. For, any, for a conductor. Mm. So, I mean, I think of, say, Joanna Malditz in Erfurt. Now, she is able to do fantastic work away from the limelight, and she will, in 10 years' time, I think, be a conductor we're all talking about. But it's so very hard. These days, for a conductor to get that kind of training, because everyone wants to focus on brilliant young conductors immediately. Yeah, and there you say, I mean, it's not, it's not so much being away from the limelight because you cannot be away from the limelight nowadays. Nowhere, yeah. you know, nowhere. You are in Erfurt, and uh, and the, uh, if it's by any means close to be good, people come and write about it. You know, the media sometimes discover genius people too early, yeah? and then they ruin them short after that. And that's the problem, the real problem. It's not the decision, but you are on the other end also, right? The opera houses in Germany, of course, um, we have, I don't think whether there's any opera house where we have a German chief conductor of the main orchestras. Of the, do you know, you know better? In Berlin it's not. It, in Frankfurt, it's not. In Stuttgart, it's not. In uh, München, it's not. Do you, do you know? They're all no. foreign people. So they, they are clever. They, they use these systems, you know, these systems. But also in the smaller ones, you know. I met a very wonderful, gifted, obviously I haven't heard him, but 
very gifted young man, and um, he was actually hoping to get a job in Aachen, yeah, which is a good city to start. You know, Aachen, Augsburg, Lübeck, all good cities, you know. And he was black, and he, he thought he didn't have any chance. He, he got the job. Kevin. Right, something like that. Very, I've never heard him, but he, I had a very good impression of, of uh, his personality. And he got the job. So people are looking in Germany, but they're still in East Germany, you know, which is still a different kind of development. I was just in Leipzig short with the Gewandhaus, and it's different. It, it, in many respects, I love it. In other respects, I wish they would be closer to us, you know. So that takes another two generations, then it will be fine. But now, actually, over there, you, you might have a chance for young people, you know, more than even in West Germany. So I mean, uh, I, but you're totally right. But the media also should be a little bit more careful about the tremendous discovery of uh, recording stars. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has the E50 of uh, film screenings changed the opera process? Um, obviously, yes. Uh, I don't know whether to the better or to the worse. I don't know. Sometimes you see, you see these things and. Uh, you hear then uh, a duet which you would like to hear rather much in front of you. you people are way back entering stage and you hear them as they would be on your, on, on your neighbor on the seat. So there's, there, there's, uh, there's things which uh, for, me, uh, for me as a musician I have my problems. You know? But anything to promote this as long as it's, it's not Bellini it's fine for me. <laughs> I mean, look, the, the sound is not always <laughs> ideal, but um, you can't knock something which makes great performances available to people who live m many miles away from, from, from them. Um, and the evidence in Europe from the leading exponents like Covent Garden, Vienna, <coughs> Milan, um, and so on, is that it has not in any way affected ticket sales I in the theatre. So that is, of course, not true in America, um, where yeah, it has had, well, although they will deny it, a serious effect. Yeah, but it, does, it didn't affect ticket sales. I it mean, if, if it does to the positive, I think, no. if it does. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty it's sure. I mean, it, it's yeah. the same when, when, the, when the television came up, and you know, and then people said, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, poor theatres, and it, it helped the theatres. Finally, there are some places where you cannot get any uh, opera in, yeah. in the United States. And, that the, and the, these places don't affect ticket sales because they don't have an opera anyway and they cannot pay for the trip, you know. So it's, it's actually... It, it's true that every advance in technology, there will be people who say this will be the end of live theatre, live concerts or whatever it is. And uh, it's always been proved wrong, hasn't it? Help the funding. I would imagine it helps us sort out the funding problem. I would be very surprised if Covent Garden and Vienna make a lot of money out of it. And if they do, they're probably keeping very quiet about it. <laughs> There's nothing to keep quiet about. There's very, very little money uh, in it, and the prospects is not necessarily but it's, it's so about encouraging. Reach. It's about outreach, about access, about giving more people the yeah. chance. It's not to make a huge extra uh, extra amount of money. Because you do a great, yeah. a great performance, you yeah. inevitably have and to And the artists, the artists earn very little on that. If, if there was a lot of money in it, the artists was pushed yeah. for a, uh, they are pushing all the time for a larger share of a very, very small cake. There's nothing the significant in it. I must say. By and large, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the. I reckon you can get. Some, if you try, you can get some Is names. Out, try and get some names out of them if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry, um, sorry. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, no, please. Nice, you spoke earlier about um, you know audiences not taking in new opera and new Thank you. 
I've made two observations actually, and I don't know at all if they are really relevant. It seems to me that younger audiences, younger people today, seem to have more open ears for new scores that I find difficult to absorb or to, well, what does understand mean, but to, to enjoy and take in. And uh, the younger part of the, the audiences are much more open and uh, seemingly capable of uh, taking much more in. And the second uh, is when I was very young and first heard Wozzeck that we started the conversation uh, with, I found that, like many people then, rather sort of confusing, erratic, and very difficult to hear and to understand. And But over my lifetime, it has become much, much more approachable and recognizable, and it is almost easy listening by now, over this period of time, for my ears. And so I would have the hope that uh, many new scores will sink into uh, the perception of people in a way that an individual can maybe not judge, but over time uh, there, is, there is some adjustment, some assimilation and some, some further development in this. Uh, I think, um, I mean, you are right. Uh, it's a matter of prejudice being prejudice. And actually, if you are educated in a certain time, you will be prejudiced against something very, very different. And I think the younger generation, of course, is, uh, must be and is more open. I mean, uh, listen to the music they, they, um, they actually enjoy uh, for millions and millions. And um, I think we underrate how much talent also is going, uh, musical talent and theatrical talent is going into the entertaining, uh, entertaining market. Let's call it market, you know. And, and actually, um, in a sense, the uh, people being a little older than young, uh, <laughs> these people should be able and should open their ears. Just get rid of being prejudiced. Don't ask people for explaining music, for instance. Music, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a very, a very wonderful support by Gustav Mahler. He hated if people <laughs> talked before a performance about this music. <laughs> You know, this so-called introduction, we call it in German Einführung, mm -hmm. you know, he hated. And I'm also, I don't like it either, I like Ausführung, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like Ausführung, that means production and, uh, and perform. And after this, after this, I'm always, I was always willing to discuss things. But first, open up, that's the real, the mm -hmm. biggest problem for elder, uh, older people is opening up to something what's happening. Same from, this goes through the, everything from politics to art, to, to philosophy, to open up. And this is actually, you listen to many things and enjoy it, and suddenly you get stuck because you haven't. When I saw the first Franz Marc, you know, a famous painter, and I, I was 15 or 14, I saw the f first Franz Marc, I saw this terrible, because they, they had blue horses, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, where's a blue horse, you know? But you open your eyes, you like it or not. You know? I, I find myself some sim sitting in productions, I open my eyes and I can't understand a bit, <laughs> I can't understand a bit of it. And then, and then I have to read afterwards in the program well, what it was meant to be. And yeah. that annoys me. I feel very inferior, but I'm also angry at, at, at sometimes a concept could be a bit simpler and a bit more approachable for average but people like myself. Totally yeah. But no, but you're yeah. in, in, yeah. a bit younger than I am. But we, are, we totally yeah. agree yeah. on that. And you know? I mean, yeah. the, 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 in a way, the implication of the question is that you're absolving composers of responsibility there, but you're not absolving directors of responsibility. No, <laughs> you, I you think want I to say, want to produce it that I can understand it. So <laughs> Look, uh, I, th yeah. I, I, I think that new art requires advocacy, and I don't mean introductory talks or, or anything like that. It needs important conductors and singers and directors Championing to it. be prepared it. to do it. It was very important to us when we did those commissions for the first decade of mm. this century that Simon Rattle did the Nick Moore, right. that, that Papano himself did, did the, mm. the Nine verse, and, and so on. Mm. And it tells something to, to, to yes. the singers yeah. and, and, and to the audience. Yeah. And I think that is a tremendous legacy 
even beyond the um, legacy of restaurateur in Frankfurt that, that, uh, <laughs> that Christophe has managed. Um, and what I would, would just say, I will say no more, really, but I, I want really to say this, is that beyond being a great musician and, and someone who gave performances that we've always enjoyed, I think that the work that Christoph did in Frankfurt and Hamburg in making opera serious as theatre was one of the most important things in, 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 in my lifetime in, in, in opera. And it's been an inspiration, not, not just for Peter and Gerard Mortier and me and, and, and others, but for whole generations of people. They may not have done it as well, but it sets in a way a standard of, you know, he, he referred to it as the entertainment business, which it is, but it isn't just that. And it does require the advocacy of people who really care about the role of theatre and theatre through music. Thank you, Nicholas. Peter, do you want to? Well, I think because I was referring to the entertainment business, to the lighter entertainment that absorbs uh, quite a number of, of uh, talented people. Nothing against people. entertainment. No, uh, no, uh, and actually, no, we, even uh, good we are yeah. all we are all entertaining. <laughs> yeah. I mean, music is entertaining. Yeah. Even even Bach was entertaining. Even the Matthäus Passion is entertaining. You know, that's all entertaining. Yeah. You know, in, in, on a different and level. And you can't you know? blame, blame Mendelssohn for rediscovering it. Right. <laughs> great. 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 Um, no, but I, I, mean, I agree totally yeah. with. I mean, they're absurd, absurd production sometimes. If people don't have any idea, ideas. You know, they shouldn't do Tosca. If it does to, if, if, if they think it has to play un, under, under, under water or whatever, I mean, they just don't do the piece. They write a new piece. You know, it's better and do it, you know. Kinder, mach was Neues. Ladies and gentlemen, unless there's a, a question that you really, that it's got to be the perfect question to tie the whole session together. I think Nicholas has <laughs> given us such a, uh, beautiful words and, uh, and all of you. Look, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Please, a huge round of applause uh, for Peter Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.